Thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today we'll talk about the geometry of compactified Jacobians, and this is joint work with Jesse Cass and Filippo Viviani. Um, and the, the motivation is that you know clearly there's a close connection between the geometry of a curve and the geometry of its Jacobian. Um, and while there's a well-developed theory of compactified Jacobians, there's less that's known about the connection uh, between the geometry of a of a singular curve and, and its compactified Jacobian, in particular, its, uh, its theta divisor. Um, so, uh, in the, so with that sort of as motivation, I, I want to look at the, the question of, um, you know, the geometry of these compactified Jacobians and their singularities. And uh, I'll also talk about, I mean, one of the main topics will be the, some applications of that to the, the study of the birational geometry of the um, compactified universal Jacobian. Um, okay, so, so let me start by um, by just giving a little bit of background. Uh, um, and, you know, first off, um, Jacobians, so curves and Jacobians. And let me recall some of the, you know, the well-known facts that I want to talk about in the context of, of singular curves. Um, so if we start with, with X a smooth curve, then we can look at it, it's Jacobian. And I want to think of it as the, the moduli of, of degree zero line bundles uh, on X of isomorphism. And inside of, uh, of here, we, we have the, the theta divisor. Um, and, you know, as I said, I want to discuss how the geometry of X is very closely related to the geometry of, of theta X. Um, and in particular, one way we can do this is we can uh, twist the Jacobian and look at it as uh, non-canonically, but we can look at it as the, the, the moduli of degree G minus one line bundles on, on the curve. And then sitting inside of here is um, the locus of line bundles uh, that have a non-trivial space of global sections. And this is identified you know, by tra up to translation with, with the, the theta divisor. And um, in this setting, th this locus is canonically determined in here. And uh, the, one of the basic theorems is the Riemann singularity theorem, which says that um, if I'm interested in, in understanding the multiplicity um, of the theta divisor at a, point, at a point L, well, this is just given to me by the dimension of the space of global sections of the line bundle. Uh, then by uh, studying the, you know, what types of uh, spaces of global sections can occur on, for a line bundle on a curve, you can say a lot about the, the singularities of the theta divisor. Um, in addition, uh, there's um, the theory of Petrie and Green. Um, let me just say, maybe for simplicity, let's just say that G is general. Um, then the canonical model of X is, is determined by the singular lo the singularities of, of the theta divisor. Um, you you look at the you could look at the um, the degree the, the multiplicity two points of the theta divisor, look at the tangent cone, the projectivized tangent space is identified with canonical space, and if you look at those projectivized tangent cones, they generate the ideal. Um, and one of the things that you can conclude from this is from a theorem of, of Kempf um, and Mumford is that the canonical model, canonical model is cut by rank four quadrics. So not only is the, the, um, the ideal generated by quadrics, but you can show that it's generated by rank four quadrics um, for this C general. Um, okay, so uh, the you know one of the basic questions I'm asking is you know what can we say about this for for singular curves? Is there anything analogous that happens for singular or maybe stable curves? Um, C is X. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, C and X will probably switch frequently. Um, 
All right, so um, it seems that from many of the talks that have preceded, I, I don't need to say too much about some of the applications, but I, I do want to just mention a few applications uh, just to remind people and, uh, and then motivate some of the other things I'm going to say. And you know, one of the, the main applications is um, you can use the geometry of um, um, the theta divisor of the Jacobian to show that threefolds are not rational. And the idea is that you can, for instance, determine the, uh, the dimension of the singular locus of, of, of such a theta divisor. You can look at the dimension of the singular locus of some theta divisor arising from some other threefold, from some other construction, and you can uh, check that that other theta divisor isn't a Jacobian in this way. And that would tell you that your threefold you were looking at was not rational. Um, let me just kind of briefly sketch parts of, of that that I want to want to look at. So, um, um, so in particular, cubic threefold. Um, so let me just remind everyone of Mumford's theorem. So if x is a cubic threefold, um, and uh, if I look at the intermediate Jacobian. Um, then uh, you can uh, say a lot about this theta divisor. It turns out that the singular locus of the theta divisor is just a single point. And moreover, if you look at the projectivization of the tangent shown at this point to the theta divisor, this is isomorphic to the cubic threefold that you started with. Um, so this gives you. Uh, For instance, uh, the, the Trelli theorem for cubic threefolds. So if I look at what was discussed earlier, this moduli space of cubics, the GIT moduli space of cubics, there's a map to A5 that this is the, the intermediate Jacobian map. And this is saying that this is injective, okay, for, for instance. Um, all right, it's, it's also telling us that the cubic threefold is not rational. Let me just uh, um, not discuss that, uh, you know, that, that again, as it's been discussed before. But let me um, you know, uh, ask uh, another related question, which is, well, uh, we, we just have now seen a Torelli theorem. Um, you might also ask you know, for sort of a Schottky type problem. How do you characterize the, the, the image of this map? Um, of course, you can do other Hodge theoretic constructions and actually get the space birational to an arithmetic quotient, which we also saw earlier. It's due to work of Alcock, Carlson, and Toledo, and Loehenga, Spirestra. Um, but um, you know, maybe in this setting, we're also interested in the image. And we can look at this, this theorem of Mumford and, um, and ask, well, this is pretty, you know, a pretty strong statement. To what extent does this condition characterize this locus? Um, and uh, you know, maybe with also the help of some some more recent, this is from the, the 70s, of course, but if, you know, with help of some more recent results, there's you know, um, a result of, of Kolar on singularities of theta divisors that tells you that uh, in dimension five, uh, you could have, uh, at worst, a five-fold point on, on a theta divisor. And so this isn't so far. Uh, and it turns out that um, there's a, a theorem of Ein and Lazarus Felton in this special case, also proven by um, Smith and Varley, that says that if you were to have a five-fold point, then uh, your abelian variety would split into um, a product of five elliptic curves. So that case is sort of very far from, from, from this, uh, where you just have an isolated singular point. And then you could try to argue, well, maybe there's no fourfold points also, um, and, and then go from there. And it does turn out that, um, so a while, well, this is now uh, quite a while ago, um, but uh, Bob Friedman and I, showed that um, if, you, if you take a principally polarized abelian variety of dimension 5 and you assume, and you can weaken this a little bit, but I'll just state it this way. If you assume that the singular locus of the theta divisor is equal to point, and the multiplicity at that point of theta is equal to 3, then a theta 
is isomorphic to the intermediate Jacobian of some cubic threefold. And of course, which cubic threefold is it? Once you know that, it's, it's, it's this one. Um, OK. Um, Well, it's smooth. smooth. Yeah, then there's a, a locus of singular ones. And you can say quite a lot about it. Um, but let me, let me not uh, <laughs> get too sidetracked, um, the motivation. But the, the motivation that I do want to, along these lines of the motivation that I do want to sort of use is, you know, well, what is sort of the closure of this locus? Also, is, you know, it might be an interesting question. question in particular, might, you might be interested in the closure of this locus in uh, the Sataki compactification of the modular of abelian varieties, uh, which is something I looked at with, with Radu Laza. Um, and you might be interested, for instance, also in the uh, toroidal compactifications, and particularly the second Voronoi compactification, where um, uh, you would have a modular compactification of this moduli space from results of LSAF. Um, and that's sort of working in progress with um, uh, Sam Bruchetsky, Klaus Hulek, and Radu, Radu Laza. Um, so um, and we, we, are gonna, we take a, a very different approach. And th those, uh, um, the work of Grushevsky Hulek uh, approaches this type of problem from the theory of theta functions, and they get quite a lot of mileage out of that. Um, and that seems like a very uh, useful approach to these types of questions. Um, what I'm about to describe is maybe a little bit of a, you know, an aspirational, uh, you know, long-term direction. But you could imagine that. Uh, so th these arguments that I'm discussing sort of work through the theory of prim varieties. Prim varieties are related to Jacobians. And uh, you could sort of hope to uh, use this type of theory to look at the generations of prim varieties and study the singularities of theta divisors for degenerate prim varieties. Let's try to say something this way. Um, and the first step in that direction is studying compactified Jacobians, which are already very little is known along those lines. Um, so that's the sort of the motivation, part of the motivation for today, talking about singularities of compactified Jacobians, um, even regardless of the, of the question of, uh, sorry, regardless of the question of, of the singularities of the data divisor. Um, OK, so, so this is some background on, on the theory of Jacobians. Uh, let me now uh, remind you of compactified Jacobians. Um, so, the um, so for, for today, um, most of my curves, x, so I'll look at singular curves, reduced curves, so reduced, for the most part, connected you know, locally planar singularities, uh, reasonably nice, but even for the most part, just think stable curves. Really, um, <coughs> where most of the mileage uh, comes. Um, but you look at your singular stable curve, let's say, and uh, you, you notice that, that immediately that pick naught of x is not finite type. So the degree 0 part is not finite type, uh, simply because you might have many components. Um, so OK, so you can sort of fix that by just you know, the obvious thing, taking the connected component of the identity. Uh, and then you still have the issue that you're this, this Jacobian may not be compact. And if um, the, the general statement is that if you have a, so let's just stick to stable curves, um, that uh, you get um, an extension. So I'll explain this notation in a second. So sorry, how do you define big for, for a singular curve? What's that? What is big not for a connected component of the identity of the moduli space of one bundles okay. of total degree zero. zero. So big is not finite. Type. Right. Uh, if I do this, then you can, if you have multiple components, it could still not be finite because you could have degree minus one and one, degree minus two and two, and so on. Uh, if I do this, I still have this problem. Um, so, um, so I get this extension. Where, um, so if I, maybe not review, maybe do, I'll do an example in a second. So gamma is the dual graph of the curve. V1 is the, the first Betty number of the dual graph. And x hat is the normalization. Um, 
So let me let me have a sort of a running example just to make sure we have the right the right picture in mind. Um, so I'll consider maybe we have two curves meeting at two nodes. Call this x1 and x2. This is x. Um, the dual graph, of course, is two points connected by these two edges. Um, if this is P1 and this is P2, then this corresponds to P1 and P2, and this corresponds to X1 and X2. And the picture that I sort of have in my mind of this setup is, is something like this. Um, so this is JX1. Pick, let's just say Jx1 times Jx2. Um, and this is my, so I get a C star bundle over the product of the Jacobians. And the reason that I know that this is rank one is because this has one loop. Okay. All right. Um, all right, let me also just remind you that there is a relative setting for, um, you know, for, for, for pick not. Um, so given reasonable families of curves, you get a, a family of, of Jacobians. Um, all right, so the question is then, how are we going to compactify uh, these spaces? And, and there's, of course, many, many ways to do this. Um, Um, so, you know, I mean, there's an Altman climate approach for, um, irredu for irreducible curves. There's an Otis Ashadri approach with a notion of fee stability and, and constructed from GIT and, and so on. And there's, there's, there's many. Today, um, I want to look at the Caparazzo, Pontari Panda, uh, I'm going to call it in Simpson. Uh, approach, um, which just says that if x, let's say x is stable, and this can be weakened quite a lot with Simpson's results, obviously, um, jxd bar is, this is a compactified Jacobian, is the moduli of rank 1, torsion free, um, slope semi stable um, sheaves. Where, where I've picked some polarization to do my stability computation. Um, OK, so let me uh, not say too much about the slope stability condition. Let me just say that, ah, thank you. Um, I've been talking about pick 0. Um, and uh, I'd like to generalize to other degrees. I didn't, uh, didn't um, so. Of degree d, so I don't. I can do this not only in, de in degree zero, so to speak. I can do this in in any degree. Oh yeah. So d is. Shouldn't it be one number or a sequence of yeah. numbers? Yeah. Uh, no, it is. Sorry. Yes, it is just one number. Yes. Um, the sum of the degrees of the. And it's not necessarily a compactification of of this uh, pick zero. There can be multiple components of this. But it is a torsor. I mean, sorry, it has a, a group, it has an action of, of the of pick zero. How do you assign a number to a torsion sheet? Yeah, I use the Hilbert polynomial to, to define a degree in a rank. <coughs> uh, let me put up an example just to sort of give a, a feel for that. I, I mean, I think that it may be best to just think of the case of an irreducible curve um, and then just use your intuition there and then sort of think about the Hilbert polynomial. Um, in general, as a second. So the component of the question is X is X is stable. Oh, what is a stable curve? Uh, okay, so it's a nodal curve. So at worst, nodal singularities, and it has a finite automorphism. Curve. In fact, really, I mean, just nodal is fine. And I mean, and you can weaken this. I mean, this can just be any projective curve. With bad 
that you want, and then Simpson's result gives you gives you this. But this is the case that I want to. Is there a choice for the for the stability for sheaves? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm always going to take the canonical polarization um, omega, but it does affect the stability condition. It, because it comes up in the Hilbert polynomial. The degree of the line bundle shows up in the Hilbert polynomial that affects this, how the total degree is computed. I just That's what I'm taking here, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, and the, the, the reason is that there's just no choice for the moduli of curves of a polarization other than powers of the conical. All right, so let me, let's do this particular example just to give a picture. So we start with, with our curves. We have this as, as pick naught. And of course, in this case, there's not too much, too many options uh, you know, for, for what the picture should look like. The picture is going to end up looking at the compacted by Jacobian in this example. It's going to look like, so this is uh, Jx1 times J x2, this is, um, this is the, the c stars, and I've, I've taken these c stars and I've glued them in some way um, together to get this picture. This is, this is also this uh, Jacobian of the normalization. And let me just sort of indicate that, um, you know, this is, you know, constructed from a GIT problem. And so, you know, th this is the degree 0, 0 line bundle. So degree 0 line bundle on x1, a degree 0 line bundle on x2. That's the open part that we're, that we're looking at. Th this part here, Corresponds obviously to the polystable points, and these are, um, you know, degree minus one and degree minus one on each component, but are not locally free at both nodes. So these are stable. These are uh, polystable, and the strictly semi-stable points correspond to um, various combinations of line bundles and rank one torsion-free sheaves that have various degrees, and uh, you know, and properties of being locally free or not at one or the other of the nodes. Um, so you get some kind of, uh, this is sort of the, the picture. And then, of course, the moduli space has strictly semi-stable points that you may have to be concerned about also. Um, is this complex, so is there something or something here? Is this compact, so is there something also at infinity? <laughs> this is compact. <laughs> yeah, it goes. <laughs> I mean, this is, these are supposed to be, so I took this guy, uh, and I filled it into a P1 bundle over Jx1 times Jx2. Oh, I and then I've got a 0 and infinity section, and then I glued them together. Um, I hope this gives the idea. In another talk, I went through a lot more of the details of this stability condition, but I feel like it ends up getting sort of technical and not really necessarily making it a, you know, a, better, a better picture. Um, OK, so, um, so let me uh, now discuss. So th these are compactified Jacobians of a, of a single stable curve. Let me now um, talk about the compactified universal Jacobian. Um, So if um, so, from Simpson's result, if you have a family of curves and a polarization, then you're going to construct a, a moduli of sheaves. Um, but the sort of the crucial point is that mg bar um, does not admit a universal curve. Um, you know, as a scheme. Um, so you can't just apply the sort of the standard techniques to, to give yourself. Um, a, a moduli space. So it's a so Caparazzo and Pandari Panda um, use a variation of GIT arg argument to um, to construct um, 
some space I'm going to call J bar DG that maps to MG bar. So this is some projective variety that parameterizes those quotes. Um, you know, rank. So let me just put it, put it this way. Maybe let's call this pi. Pi inverse of x is equal to the compactified Jacobian of x up to the automorphisms of x. Um, let me make a, a small advertisement for my student uh, while, while we're on this topic. This is something of a side note, but since we're interested in the birational geometry, or I am, in the birational geometry of the space, um, you might be interested in whether there's other uh, models, you know, as well that you might easily get in the same, in a similar way. And this is what I mean by that. Um, so this is sort of an aside, but um, there's been interest in this, you know, log minimal model program on the moduli of curves. We can look at these so-called mg bar of alpha. I'm just going to describe this very briefly. So I apologize, but this is proj of the ring of sections of um, mg bar. Uh, um, and the, 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 um, the, the class uh, KMG bar plus alpha times the boundary. So this is the boundary of MG bar and alpha is some rational number between 0 and 1. Um, and these spaces, the, the reason that we're, one is looking at these spaces is that when alpha is equal to 1, it's known that this gives you the moduli of curves. When alpha is equal to 0 and k is big, this would give you the canonical model. And you're hoping that as you decrease alpha, you, you may sort of be able to say what's happening at each step in this process and eventually maybe describe the canonical model of the moduli space of curves as a moduli space in its own right. Uh, let me just uh, point out that, um, for instance, so let me just reiterate, mg bar of 9 11 1 is equal to mg bar. By this, I mean if you take any alpha in this interval, then you will get back mg bar. And mg bar of um, 7 tenths, 9 11 is what's known as Schubert's moduli of pseudostable curves. Um, these are curves that where you throw out in your moduli problem the curves with, with elliptic tails. And you replace in your moduli problem uh, the reverse of what you'd get from stable reduction. And in this case, it's a cusp. So I take all of these curves, I throw them out of my moduli problem, I then allow cusps. And then I get a new, uh, in fact, Deline Mumford stack, uh, which parameterizes slightly different curves. Okay. Um, and uh, so the, the recent theorem of Matt Grimes, um, and I should say that so the distinction between Caporazzo's work and Pandre Pondre's work is that Pandre Pondre does this also for uh, torsion free sheaves of any rank. Um, and the, the rank one case had already been done by Caporazzo in, in a different way. Um, so sort of following the technique of Pandre Ponda, um, Matt Grimes um, was, was able to show that there's um, so J B pseudostable G mapping to MG bar pseudostable. Um, let me even, um, so he's able to show that there's a compactified universal Jacobian over this moduli space as well. And, he, and for any rank uh, of sheaves as well. Um, so there's another, and of course there's other spaces that are, that are known to show up in this program and he's currently working on, on uh, Constructing other spaces that would lie over other moduli spaces of curves that show up in this way. And what are the, the fibers in this case? The, the same thing. Okay. You obtain it by running a He hasn't determined that yet, but I mean, there's sort of some reason to believe that probably, because there's some natural bundles, there's this relative theta. You expect that that probably, I mean, in some degrees, so you expect that probably it, it should. And, I mean, you'll see that the canonical bundle is very close to related. Uh, so, but I don't know yet. Um, okay, so um, so that gives sort of the setup, and now I'd like to um, sort of let me discuss a little bit more the, the my exact motivation for studying the singularities of of a, of a fixed compactified Jacobian. So I'm really going to describe today are singularities of of these spaces, and um, 
I find that that seems somehow a little bit technical. Um, so let me motivate why you know it's important to me. Um, um, so a little more motivation. So one, I'd like to to look at the Riemann singularity theorem. So Caporazzo. asked um, uh, the following question. So um, if you, you know, what is the relationship? So I, I guess I should have mentioned more explicitly, but um, these compactified Jacobians in degree g minus 1 um, um, come with, with theta divisors defined in the same, the same way. And um, she asked the question, well, we have this theta divisor. What is the relationship between the multiplicity of a point on the theta divisor and uh, the, the space of global sections of the corresponding rank one torsion free sheaf. Um, just a really naive, you know, basic naive question that you would ask from the, the Riemann singularity theorem for, for smooth curves. And um, the, the first, I mean, if, so there's, um, if you look at integral curves or you look at line bundles on singular curves, then you can use the standard uh, Kempf approach. And that, that goes back to, Kempf and, and Beauville, and uh, so you can certainly say something. But when you start looking at torsion-free sheaves, then uh, the question is, is, is sort of is more complicated. And um, or, or complicated in a different way, I should say. Um, and so uh, the first sort of result that, that Jesse Cass and I made in this direction um, was to say that if x is an integral nodal curve, um, then um, multiplicity of the point of theta is equal to kind of what you would expect It's equal to the dimension of the space of global sections, but then, of course, there's a contribution from the, the ambient singularity. So it's essentially what this is saying is that you have some cardiac divisor being cut by some function, and uh, and it's cutting on you know it's cutting out on this space something sort of transverse to the tangent cones here. That's sort of the naive way to, to think about this. So you're getting exactly what you expect is what, is what this is saying, and this is um, two to the n, where n is equal to the number of nodes where i fails to be locally free. And, and what is the proof? So the, the proof is really what motivates. Um, am I claiming that? Let me, um, yes, in the integral case, yeah, because you get it by the determinant um, construction. So in this case, yeah. Um, and in fact, in general, you like local, you know, I mean, yes, I, I, I think so. Um, so, um, okay, so what the proof is, is, is the following. So I, I just, I want to do sort of a naive, yeah. Join them from the nodes? So. Is, is it disjoint theta from the nodes? No, no, it's, a, no, no, there will be, sorry, sorry. no, no, it's okay. Yeah, but um, <laughs> at the points where you don't meet the nodes, then the argument is, is where, where the, the, the sheaf is, um, so let me. No, no, this one, I mean, there are these nodes in the, in the compact. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Joined from it? No, no. That's no, it the second means. factor. So. Oh. Yeah, that's this. That's the second factor. Yeah, there will be sheaves that have global sections that fail to be locally free, and those will be in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I mean, it also it shouldn't be too surprising because the moduli states itself is nodal. Okay. Right. So. Um, okay. Um, so, so what I want to do is I want to test uh, if, I, if I, this is my theta divisor, I want to take some arc. Uh, in, and this is my compactified Jacobian. I want to take some arc and I want to understand the restriction of the theta divisor to this arc. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the key point is that the moduli space itself looks, as I was just mentioning, it, it looks nodal. In general, this approach will fail. Even if you have a Cartier divisor but on some singular space, you, you may not be able to find a, an arc that actually determines the order of vanishing. But um, in this case, the, the picture is more like this. And we have some theta divisor, and we, we are able to show that we can find some arc that that does in fact uh, compute this order of vanishing. Um, um, so, um, so we compute the order of vanishing on um, on a test arc. 
and, and this gives the multiples. Um, so the, the easy part is actually constructing test arcs and looking at the order of vanishing of this determinant cohomology. So, so, so you, you that this, the test arcs are sort of easy. The hard part is actually determining whether or not um, you're actually computing the correct multiplicity. And for that, you really need to know the local structure of the compactified Jacobian. And not just that, you need to, since I want to construct these arcs as one parameter families of sheaves, I need to know what this local structure looks like in terms of deformations of sheaves. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the key point is, is, is to, to set that up. So that's one of the reasons I'm interested in studying the singularities of these compactified Jacobians. Uh, the, the second reason is, uh, is I like to study the, the universal, compactified universal Jacobian um, and its singularity so that I can try to look at the Kodaira dimension of, the, of this moduli space. Um, so we have this, this, this map to mg bar, um, and uh, you know, the fibers are generically Jacobian, so you feel like you should know what uh, the Kadara dimension is here. Um, and in fact, let's, you can compute the canonical class on, uh, on JDG bar. This is Bini, Fontanari, and Viviani, but you can do a quick heuristic to convince yourself that this formula is true. Um, what, what should be going on? You, 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 you just use, um, you know, the, you imagine this morphism is smooth. You look at the, the cotangent bundles, and of course you get the canonical class of mg bar plus the Hodge class pulled back. So um, kj bar is equal to pi upper star of k mg bar plus lambda, which is equal to pi upper star of 13 lambda minus delta minus 2 delta plus lambda. And immediately, if you look at the moduli of curves a lot, you say, oh, this is going to be easy because the slope of this divisor is 7, not 6.5. So um, you're, you're in much better shape. So since there haven't been too many talks on, um, on the moduli of curves, let me just briefly review the, uh, the, the divisor theory. Um, <coughs> on the moduli of curves that makes this problem appear to be quite easy, um, which is, um, okay, so I should try to make this a little briefer for the sake of time, though. Um, so if you, so we'll write, um, so S of mg bar is equal to the infimum over all S <laughs> such that S lambda minus delta is big. Um, lambda is known to be big, and you're sort of figuring out how, how much you can take away and still, uh, still be big, how much lambda you have to add to this to, to make it big. And uh, uh, so we know that the Kodaira dimension of this, so the Ataka dimension of 14 lambda minus 2 delta is equal to 3g minus 3 if the slope of mg bar is less than 7, and it's minus infinity of the slope of mg bar is greater than 7. Um, and uh, let me, maybe, maybe I will just sort of paraphrase this a little bit. So, um, uh, so work of Harris, Mumford, Eisenbud in various combinations, and Farkash, um, Farkash Popa, Potterill, um, answers this question for us already. Um, so essentially, for this, that for, so let me just sort of try to at least make it a little more clear. For mg bar, you're interested in, in the number six and a half. Here we're interested in seven. So people have been trying to construct, you know, divisors with effective divisors with slope less than six and a half uh, since they've already succeeded quite well uh, in doing that. Uh, for, for slope, the this, this seven number were, were, um, were set. So let me just say that. Um, the, this, you know, so this whole story tells you immediately that um, uh, 
talk of dimension of 14 lambda minus 2 delta is equal to minus infinity if g is less than or equal to 9, um, 0 if g is equal to 10, 19 if g is equal to 11, um, and 3g minus 3 if g is greater than or equal to 12. Okay, so um, let me, uh, maybe I won't write out this whole table. Um, um, but uh, let me make a couple of comments. So here it seems as though we, we have already computed the, the Kodaira dimension of the space, except that there's one, you know, probably in this crowd, you don't have to emphasize this, there's one important thing still to check, which is that your space actually has canonical singularities. Um, and uh, um, so this, you know, in, you know, for some audiences, that's probably sort of a, a technical point, but um, I should emphasize that, um, um, you know, so if you look at the Harris Mumford, uh, you know, uh, paper where they first do this argument for mg bar, the, the proof that the, uh, the space has canonical singularities is, is not a small part of that paper, um, you know, in terms of length. It's a significant chunk of the argument, and I actually hadn't really appreciated that until I, uh, you know, came to this question. And um, um, so let me, so the main theorem in this setting is exactly like that. Um, um, JDG bar has canonical singularities if the genus is at least four. Okay. And so that tells us that in that range, uh, this, this here does compute the Kodaira dimension. Okay. Um, so one of the reasons that I, so let me just make a couple of remarks. <coughs> I'll talk about this, this argument in a, in a minute, but let me first. Um, but, um, but if you are pressing to like a finite cover of MG, such that you have like fine fine moduli. I mean, you have a family of curves. Then JDG would be smooth. Or? Um, so, so, so no, no. So JD, so JDG, it's a smooth stack, but in general, it'll be an Artin stack, um, not a really Mumford stack. Because this has a big torsion. That's kind of the one of the, the points. Um, I'll come. I'll try to come to some of this. Um, but that 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 approach is sort of. Maybe some people are thinking this is the back of their mind for the, the statement about the construction of the space. You, you could, you know, maybe you're thinking maybe also about you know, Simpson's argument and taking covers and that you, know, you can take <coughs> a stack theoretic approach to this construction. And that's also something that Matt is, is writing up. Um, okay, so uh, the first, I think the, the first thing I'd like to say is that the Kodaira dimension of mg bar is not known. Or um, you know, g equals uh, what 17 up to 21, and for 22, so 17 up to tw uh, 23. Um, so somehow we have the space mapping down. We understand its Kodaira dimension. You know, if there's any justice, we could try to you know fill in the rest. But obviously, that's a you know pointless, <laughs> hopeless uh, you know uh, argument. But you could ask also: Is it true that the Kodaira dimensions, at least when they're known, that they always agree? That's also not true, um, since we have uh, this sort of uh, situation here. I think it's also interesting. I, I think, you know, a little while ago, I'm sure there's many spaces now, but you know, Gabby Farkas, I remember asking me, you know, do you know of any like sort of naturally occurring moduli spaces where you don't just go from Kodaira dimension minus infinity to um, maximal Kodaira dimension? Um, and here's sort of a, 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 an example where you you at least have two intermediary steps uh, in the in the process. And now there's other spaces, um, but as well. But, but I, I think that's sort of a need, a need yeah. fact. Um, okay, so I should other, make some other, you know, attribution. So um, Farkash and Vera um, have determined the Kodaira dimension if um, d is equal to g, um, and they use the universal curve. So you look at sort of the Abel map, and that makes it easier to, to, to. Uh, I mean, it gives you another technique, I should say. Um, there's also work of Farkash, uh, sorry, of, um, of um, Viviani 
uh, Bini, Fontanari, and Viviani, um, if maybe the GCD of D plus 1 minus G and 2G minus 2 is equal to 1. And the key point is that then this gives you a smooth domain Mumford stack, and you can, um, it, it makes a lot of the computations easier. Um, in particular, this doesn't give you degree D equals 0 or G minus 1. Um, and they also do G greater than equal to 22, which is another comment I'd like to, to make. Maybe I'll just make it, it briefly. Um, so there's results of, of Yuno and, and Kawamata that tell you if you know the Kodaira dimension of mg bar is of general type, uh, sorry, if you know it's, it's, uh, if mg bar is of general type, you can immediately from this fact here say that, that um, the Kodaira dimension of this will be uh, maximal, 3g minus 3. So in all the, the cases where the Kodaira dimension you know, in this is, is big, you sort of get this for free. Um, so uh, it, what I'm about to say is already sort of predicted there, but one of the things that, that you get from this is that this also does not depend on the d. It just, you know, it just depends on the g. And um, you might wonder if that's true because all of these spaces are, are birational. I mean, they're all parameterizing, you know, Jacobians of some degree, and those Jacobians themselves are isomorphic, so you could just wonder, is this some kind of um, you know, how are those two spaces related? But in fact, if I have time, I'll explain later that uh, these spaces are not, uh, in general, birational. So um, uh, they're, they have the same Kodaira dimension, but it's not for, for that trivial reason. Um, okay, and then the other thing is I should, you know, ask the audience, if anyone does have an idea about how to get from the Kodaira dimension here to the Kodaira dimension there, then uh, please, you know, tell me. Um, I'd like to know. Um, okay, and we, we also have a, a theorem about um, the singularities of the, com the, the fibers of this map, um, but I'm not going to state it for the, the sake of time. Okay, so how does the, the proof of this theorem go? Um, so, um, so the question is local. So you pick a pair, a, a curve and a sheaf, and um, you know that's polystable. Um, and uh, you you try to, I mean, what we want to, you know, the, the the approach is clear. You you want to describe the local structure of the space. So it it should just be, you know, you take the deformation space of this pair and mod out by the automorphisms. Of, of the pair, okay, where you then describe the action. Of course, this is, so this is an Artin stack. So you don't get this for free. Um, so for a Deline Mumford stack, then this type of statement is for free, but you know, for a general Artin stack, you don't know this. Jared Alper has some papers on describing when this type of statement holds for a general Artin stack. But you have to do some work, uh, and in this case, though, you're, you're sort of saved by, um, you know, by the the GIT construction and the Luna slice theorem. Um, so this essentially allows you to to conclude this. So that really, the key point then is to describe um, what is that deformation space, and and what is the the action of the automorphism group. Okay, so the, the ring, so the deformation ring, I'm just going to call R of xi, is equal to the tensor product over E and the edges of gamma. Gamma is the dual graph. Where I've, um, let me, I'm just going to, there is some, one technical point I should add to that, but which is just that um, you should smooth the nodes where the, the, the sheaf is locally free. I'm just going to ignore that for the time being. Um, So take the, you take the product of the deformation spaces of this universal curve over the node. Um, and I mean, how do you sort of think that you look at the deformation space of the node, then you look at the, 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 the diagonal in there, and that gives you the universal ideal sheaf. Um, and this is just that. Um, and there's um, an exact sequence. The first line, I mean, on, on top of the quotient. Oh, what, is, what is this? <coughs> 
What, what yeah, you can't read it. Sorry. Ah, okay. I'm working over C anyway. <laughs> and then, yeah, sorry, so it's a polynomial ring in three variables. And I'm using sort of a, um, a pneumatic, uh, which is that I have edges of my graph. But imagine, I'm going to take sort of like, I don't know, from Sarah's book, his convention, that the graph actually is, already comes with two edges for each edge, one going one way and one going the other. So if my graph looks like this, then secretly I'm imagining that there's actually two edges there, one going one way and one going the other way. And then I'm just indexing my variables by those edges, one going one way and one going the other way. Thanks, that must be <laughs> the confusion. Thank you. Um, and. Uh, and then I'm just saying that, um, so I, I just, I'm taking products of, of, of those things. And uh, this is just saying that I'm indexing th these products by the edges. But the reason that it, it won't really, you'll see in a second why uh, I want to have this indexing. Just make something convenient in a moment. Um, OK, so I've got the automorphisms of the sheaf, mapping to the automorphisms of the pair mapping to what I'm calling stab, um, the stabilizer for x of i, mapping to 0, which is, this is contained in the automorphisms of x. So this is, there would be a map to the automorphisms of x, and these are exactly those automorphisms that arise from that forgetful map. So they're automorphisms of x, so that when you pull back the sheaf by that automorphism, it is isomorphic to the sheaf you started with. Um, OK, and uh, so what we need to do is understand uh, this action on this uh, ring. Um, so the automorphisms of I are, are easy to describe. The product uh, V and V of gamma of C star and the action. So, um, so if I take some lambda, I can tell you what the action is on X E. This is equal to lambda source of E, um, lambda target of E uh, inverse. X e, so let me um, explain that. So for um, for each edge, we have a variable. Okay, each edge has a source and a target. The source and the target are vertices. So for each vertex, we have a number, and we use this rule to multiply. Okay, and you do the similar thing for the other variables. And lambda t is just the identity. OK, so then you, you look at this, this action, and you start to think about what this is doing. And it's telling you that, um, essentially, the, the invariants of this, this action on, on this, uh, th this ring are going to be those, um, you know, the monomials will be those monomials that are, have exponent cycles in the, in the graph. OK, um, and so this way, you, I'm just, what I'm just trying to say is that you can see from this that you can quickly go from this to some kind of combinatorial ring uh, that's described from the graph. Okay, and then you try to classify those types of rings, um, and uh, you end up with, um, um, sorry, you, I mean, you get a, sorry, for a related graph in this case, and you, uh, you, you get a description of this, um, this space where I, have, so this leads to deformations xi modulo ot i as a combinatorial ring, you know spec of a combinatorial ring. Um, OK, so I want to, um, let me paraphrase the rest of the proof so I can just at least mention a couple of other consequences of, of this theorem. So the, the hard part then becomes uh, describing what is the action of this finite group of automorphisms. So it's, it's sort of at first seems that this might be the easy part. But in fact, this is, like, this is kind of the, the, the technical point in this argument. And, um, and if you kind of look in the literature, you think, well, uh, look at Harris-Mumford. And uh, the key point is that when you have a smooth Lillian Mumford stack, then you can just use read tie. And you just uh, you know, look at the, the deformations. You look locally, and you come up with some estimates, and, and it gives you a way of doing this. And you say, OK, well, I don't have a Lillian Mumford stack, but uh -huh, you know, Shepard Barron uh, proved something similar for, um, for uh, the moduli of, of abelian varieties. And uh, then you look in the argument, and you realize, well, that sort of has this technical point that that stack is toric in the sense that the automorphisms act as toric automorphisms. 
Okay, that also makes it easier. In fact, if you try to use that argument in the case of mg bar, you get a very quick proof that mg bar has, uh, um, has canonical singularities. Unfortunately, that argument doesn't hold because the automorphisms of mg bar don't act <laughs> torically. <laughs> so you have to think about that. So even though people often say it's a, tor you know, it's a torx, you know, the stack is toroidal, they really just mean that in terms of the, the mini-versal space, not that also the automorphisms <laughs> act that way. Um, so in this case, <laughs> we're sort of stuck in the sense that we uh, don't have a smooth delay Mumford stack. And we don't have, um, have uh, this, this Arden stack that, that is toroidal in that sense. So um, we actually were kind of st stuck for a little bit. And then we realized that, I mean, if you think about read tie, it's really just a statement about a polytope in toric geometry. It's just asking whether or not when you add an, a lattice element, the new lattice you get uh, sits inside of your polytope or not. Um, and so then, since we have these toric rings, you just apply that. You know, it gets much more complicated because you don't have a simple polytope. But it turns out that the polytopes that show up were simple enough that we could use that strategy. And, and that's what. Um, what gives the rest of the proof. So that's sort of the, the short version. And in the last couple of minutes, maybe I'll just say in words uh, you know, some of the main uh, consequences. So, so this gives um, that the, the singularities are canonical in the range that I, that I said, and that is enough to determine the Kadaira dimension. And then sort of for free from this, you get a lot of other uh, nice results, um, or things that I thought were, were quite interesting and I, I, was, uh, I liked a lot. Um, uh, so um, the first thing that you get from this is you get you can describe the Ataka vibration. Um, you know, so you know the Kadaira dimension. You know you have this morphism to mg bar. So of course, in the appropriate range, that's the Ataka vibration. Okay, so it's not too surprising. But um, and then in the other cases, you can also describe the Ataka vibration. Um, but uh, let's just think in that range. Um, and once you have the Ataka vibration, then you can start asking things like. What is the birational automorphism group of, uh, of, of this moduli space? Okay. And um, well, the, we, we show that this is either the identity or Z mod 2Z. Um, and um, I have a couple of, of minutes, and so I'll just say in words again. Uh, okay, okay, thanks. I'll, I'll probably just, since it'll take me a while to go through the argument, I'll probably just end a couple minutes early. Let me say in briefly how, how this works. Um, you, um, you start considering a birational automorphism of your moduli space. And you use the fact that this is the Ataka vibration in a theorem of, of, of you know to, to, to say that this induces a birational automorphism of mg bar. Okay. Then you can use the Torelli theorem to say, OK, well, in fact, if you think about what this is saying, that this has to be the identity down here. Okay. So, so it has to be a birational automorphism over the identity. Okay. Then once you have that, <laughs> then you start realizing that this birational automorphism is giving you a rational section. Okay, but then we know that the only rational sections are uh, twists of the canonical. Okay, then that puts a limit on you know when these guys can be birational, and then you look at the degrees, and that tells you that there's only some special cases where where you can get um, um, non-trivial birational automorphisms. Um, okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Last claim is for G at least nine or G, oh yeah, yeah, G twelve. G greater than equal to twelve. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and the other ranges would be really interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Uh. <coughs> Any questions? Right. So when the polar dimension is zero for us, what's the drive category and what's the <laughs> what's the mirror duel? <laughs> I think there's a talk coming later. Any more? No. no. Okay, so we thank the speaker again.